Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about all things Beatles, their past, their history, things going on in the news, anything connected with the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the co-hosts of the show, and some of you know me for another Beatles show that I host called Every Little Thing, and I'm being joined by my three regular co-hosts of the show. We'll start with the man who writes for Beatles Examiner, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And also from Beatle Fan Magazine, we have Al Sussman. Hi, Ken. Hi, everybody. And also from Beatle Fan and also culture reporter for the New York Times, we have Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken, and hello, everybody. On the show this time, we actually have our very first guest. <laughs> for the new show with the four co-hosts, and that is the author of a new book called Beetleness, and her name is Candy Leonard. Hello, Candy. Welcome to Things We Said Today. Hi, Ken. Thank you for inviting me to the show. Actually, thank you. Thank all of you, the, the panel, for inviting me. I appreciate it. We all unanimously have been talking about having you on the show, because we've all been raving about your book, and... Uh, the first question that I have to ask, which is an obvious question, is what makes this book different from other Beatle books, and what was the purpose behind doing it? Well, I think it's different in, in several ways. The, the main way it's different is that it captures the fan experience, and while there have been some oral histories and there have been books that certainly you know, have reminiscences from fans over the years, this is the only book that takes that the fan's narrative, the fan's voice, and puts it through a lens of sociology, child development, cultural history, and also takes it through the entire timeline. So it's not simply, oh, I remember when they came to Shea, or I remember Ed Sullivan and what a thrill it was. It, it takes it through the whole timeline from Ed Sullivan all the way to watching Let It Be, in a dark movie theater in May of 1970, and how people reacted as individuals, as male, well, also breaks down the male-female um, aspect of it, and fans of different ages reacted differently. So it really looks at the fan experience um, just in a in a different way. So so it's it's and by doing that, I guess <laughs> sort of segue into the second part of your question, which is why write it? Why what was the motivation for writing it? It, it's that's a very long story, but basically, I mean, I wanted to tell this, have this fan experience, and also this notion of the Beatles changed everything, right? People always say and have been saying for years, the Beatles changed everything, changed everything. Well, what does that really mean? And so, I wanted to break that down and show how they changed everything, fan and by fan by fan, record by record, and how the experience of individual fans collectively um, had a, a huge social impact that we generally refer to as, quote, the 60s. So I really wanted to take on that issue of showing how they changed everything. And also, um, you know, it's a, it's a different voice, too, and that it's a female voice, and most of the books have been written by men. So it was, you know, I was, it's something I wanted to do for many, many years. I had several false starts with it and had to put it aside for various reasons. Different priorities can come up in life that you have to, you know, put projects aside, whatever, and, and do things perhaps that are more practical than your labor of love. But uh, in 2012, I realized it's kind of, this is it. I have to write this book now. So, and it, you know, obviously because of the 50th, which I didn't, I mean, I, I didn't make it for February, but I did make it in for the 50th year. So, I don't, did I answer your question? Okay. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Al, Al, you have a question? Uh, well, first thing, I need to, uh, f full disclosure, I'm actually one of Candy's subjects in yes. the book. We had a yes. number of lengthy conversations in which she asked me about virtually every thought I had from the beginning, from January of 64, right up through watching, watching Let It Be. And what was really an eye-opener for me in reading the book was the uh, you, you basically took the entire, as we call the the baby boom generation, uh, including people who were born even in the early 60s, 
And I was the the thing that was probably most of most uh, of an eye opener for me was when you talk about the Beatles changing everything, how some of the younger fans, fans born in the late 50s and early 60s, weren't really all that ready for that change. In fact, it's kind of apropos uh, apropos of conversations that we had where I told you about younger friends of mine who I would play Rubber Soul Revolver for, and they were, you know, not nearly as excited about it as I was. Right. Right. Well, I think we forget that a lot of first generation fans were children. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. young children, six, seven, eight. I mean, I was seven years old. Um, I think the youngest person I interviewed was born in 1961. And so, you know, a lot of, you know, these fans were, were children. And so we were exposed to I mean, pop music, which we might have been exposed to somewhat before, but never, we never took possession of it, you know, like we did with this. And so we were really, really paying close attention and getting caught up in the whole mania of it with older siblings, kids down the block, the babysitter, whoever it was who who, who uh, roped you in if you were on the young side, an older sibling would let you go, come into their room because you liked the Beatles, you know, the big kids let you hang out with them. So, you know, what we often forget that a lot of these young, these first generation fans were young children. And of course, if you liked the Beatles, the big kids let you hang out with them. And they let you sit around and discuss the songs with them. And, and they kind of schooled you in everything that was cool and, and beatly. So young kid might have had some music in, the, you know, the really young ones might have had music in their lives before the Beatles. It might have been pop music or more likely it was maybe Disney records or Alvin and the Chipmunks, whatever. But we didn't own the music in the way that we did with um, when the Beatles came. I mean, that was ours, you know, immediately. And... So it it changed the culture of childhood because suddenly you have these mixed age groups that are assembling in, you know, rec rooms and basements and, you know, someone's bedroom listening to the Beatles and sharing not only the music, but also the other experiences that that people bring to listening to music. So they're talking about it with their friends and, and going on dates and dancing. And so suddenly you have six, seven, eight year olds privy to these kinds of conversations and this little glimpse into adulthood and and the you know grown being a little more grown up than we were alan you're next okay i mean i'm not sure i have questions so much as kind of observations um yeah. I, you know I, I was nine when all this was happening or the 1964 end of it at least was happening and so a lot of the people in the book um it, it's almost as if i could tell you who they were because they were all my <laughs> friends even though obviously you know they were totally different people than I actually knew um, but I think that one of the interesting things about the book was that um, even though there's a diversity of opinion in in all of these things the fact that it sounded so much like me and my friends and people I knew uh, really kind of made in a sense, it, it made me feel that the experience was even more universal than I sort of remembered it being. And so while when I started the book, I thought, well, it's a little bit microcosmic to be you know, interviewing all of these people about what their experiences were as kids listening to the Beatles. In a way, I, I think by the end, I began to feel that it gave you actually more of the big picture than um, than just a standard biography, you know, because it, it, it really sort of supported that sense of how universal it was that these people you spoke to were, I guess, primarily American, but from all over the country and many different ages and... Um, so, I, I mean, I, I just found that sort of an interesting aspect. Um, I guess one question would be, I, I, there's one bunch of quotes that sort of from, I guess, Rubber Soul on kind of become pervasive and that I really didn't understand because it wasn't my experience. But um, that is how many people found aspects of the late Beatles music scary. I mean, people kept saying I was scared by strawberry fields and walrus and I, I just don't get it so what did you make of that yeah i, I didn't get it either i, I think that i do 
at one point, it's funny because I remember thinking about this, and I, I said something in the book like um, some younger fans maybe, I just want to say open-minded, it's maybe more adventurous or more open to, you know, weirdness than others. Um, I mean, I was seven. I didn't, I found it strange. I found it compelling, but it, it didn't scare me, you know. But some people who were seven or eight, when those videos, the famous, uh, you know, Strawberry Fields video, not so much the Penny Lane one, but the, well, of course, the appearance was, was you know, startling in both. But the Strawberry Fields video in particular uh, really kind of freaked a lot of people out. And and that's when many, you know, kind of turned, you know, put the Beatles on a back burner and went to look to the monkeys. Why it scares some people, I don't know. I mean, it gets back to, you know, it just may be that the Beatles have become so familiar and, and it's such a comforting presence. And and suddenly they look different. They sound different. In fact, there's one fan I quote who says, like, what happened to my brothers? What happened to, you know, there was a, she almost had a feeling of mourning um, because the Beatles were, you know, the, the Beatles she knew were gone. And I don't know. I mean, I think that it really depends on how open people were to weirdness, whether, you know, if you had an older sibling who teased you if you didn't like it, you know, there's the whole peer pressure. Because, you know, again, this all happened in groups of, you know, it happened in packs of kids, you know, a lot of it, not all of it, because we also listened alone. But so there was some peer pressure, you know, if you, you know, if you don't like this, you're not cool, you know, that whole thing. Um, but yeah, some people genuinely, I mean, I heard that over and over again, that, that it was frightening, you know, particularly um, Strawberry Fields and uh, I think a Blue Jay Way, I think, and huh. also um, Within You, Without You was not so much frightening as it was kind of like awe, and, you know, like almost some, somebody said it was like being in church, you have to like pay attention, and it was very serious. You know? <laughs> so that was different, you know, that was very different than what they were doing certainly at the, from the beginning you know but it's it's funny because they were paying i mean the other quotes are how much attention they were paying to the straight pop stuff they were memorizing the words as soon as the record yeah. came out and so you you it, you would think that they like something that they have to pay attention to and and the other thing is the sense another sense sort of a substring that comes out um through a lot of the interviews is the degree to which people saw the Beatles as kind of leaders, you know, when, in the sense of if the Beatles are doing this, it must be cool, so I'm going to get into that. But I guess not everybody could go along with every move that they made. Well, it depends how old you were, you know. I mean, certain, you know, certainly that came up a lot in, in the Woodstock chapter and the later, you know, the, the whole hippie thing and beyond, you know, 67 to 69, where, you know, younger fans were very tuned in, but not really old enough to participate, or like they, a lot of them said, I wasn't old enough to be a real hippie. You know, they sort of were watching it from the sidelines, but they were aware of what was going on, even if they were too young to um, participate. And, you know, you, like... Um, you know, not everybody grew their hair. Not everybody started a band. Not you know, so there were different. You know, there were many ways to be a Beatle fan, um, which is the you know, depending on how old you were and you know whether you're a male or female. So the younger fans, you know, they found other ways. So while some people were, were you know, uh, going off to San Francisco, others were still playing Beatle games. You know, so it was really a, a very wide range of response. Mm -hmm. I just wanted yep. to say, Alan, that because of the first question that you asked, back in 1967 when I heard A Day in the Life, that scared me to death. Really? And maybe it was because it was all about being in a car crash, and I kept thinking someone was going to be killed in a car crash, and you had this incredible orchestra buildup. That really scared the heck out of me as a little kid. Hmm. So I can certainly relate to all these other you know, young kids who found Strawberry Fields or I Am the Walrus to be scary or within you without you even when, even when people were scared they i mean some of them stopped listening but it was it was sort of like an approach avoidance it's like it you it was a little bit scary but you were like watching between your fingers you know <laughs> right ken you Steve? were eight at the time right i was eight then yeah a lot of the music especially the weird stuff i had a tough time adjusting to i mean i liked listening to it but i just didn't get it I think I Am the Walrus was so strange to me. I didn't understand the meaning behind it. 
it was such a weird song for its time. And uh well, you know, a day in the life like I, <laughs> <laughs> But a, a lot of those really the psychedelic stuff it was probably very difficult for a, a young kid to to understand and absorb. Absolutely. I have yeah. I have one observation before I ask what I was going to ask. Candy, I, I don't know if I, t- I, I think I, I may, may have mentioned this when we were in L.A., but um, I remember listening to WABC when Strawberry Fields came out, and I remember Dan Ingram, who's a very well-known, I mean, you know, very famous name and was basically the partner of Cousin Brucey on WABC, really freak, freaking out over Strawberry Fields and the, all the all the, because of how advanced it was from what the Beatles had been doing. And it kind of, you know, that whole scary kind of thing that Beatles were on a, a new front. You know, they were they were forging ahead, and they were not going to be the 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 '64 Beatles anymore. They weren't, weren't going to be the mop tops anymore. And and that, yeah, that there was a whole, you know, you could you could spend a lot of time and and you do on that in the book. But my question goes back to the basics in '64. Um, the whole idea of, of what, where the, where the, the word Beatles came from, and also the, the you know, the, the discovery on February 9th, 64, of, of the Beatles uh, on the Ed Sullivan Show, and how it, you know, the, the sociological impact on families. I know personally, there was quite, there was quite of a, 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 an impact on my family as we sat there watching it. I mean, the reactions were different between myself and my sister and my parents, and I'm sure it was that way all around the country. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, the whole idea of Beatles, where did that come from, and, and the and you know the, what was the impact on families all around the country when when the Beatles came into when everybody found out about them? Right. Well, um, I'll talk about Beatles first. You know, the whole phenomenon is so strange still to think about. <laughs> Sometimes you can sort of step back and look. Look at the, the, the scale of it, you know, and and it, it, it's very difficult to describe. It kind of needed its own word. Now, you know, it is possible that other people have put together the word Beatles. To my knowledge, I was, you know, it was unique to me. But I, but I recognize that other people who think about the Beatles and who will like to play with language may have very well stumbled upon the phrase as well because it's, it's pro- it might be out there in some other forms. But I felt that it need it just kind of summed it up, you know, like the, it 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 was a way of describing the feelings that they evoke, their essential qualities that that we responded to so profoundly, um, the remnant of it out in the world, you know, whether it's advertisement or or newspaper headline or you know the many many references we see the uh, parodies of album covers which seem to be endless so all that you know the sort of the three definitions of Beatles that I talk about in the in the book well, I sort of lay it out in the open I think it's the epigraph beginning of the book so yeah I mean it needed its own word you know now as far as the second part about families it had a huge impact on on families uh, because everybody had a very strong opinion fathers did not like them from the get-go uh, for the most part they didn't like the hair and they also didn't like the exuberance. The kids got so wound up and out of control. And and fans in the book, you know, the, the story is about how just 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 not clear why, but dads would just like, shut it down. Like they would change the channel, or they would, you know, say, you know, you got to quiet down, and we'll take the records away, whatever. So the, there was a um, you have to have an opinion. You know, that there was such a strong presence in the household. I mean, one fan described it, it was like having another sibling in the house, you know, that there was this presence. And so parents had to deal with it, you know, whether it was being used to, you know, as a way of rewarding good behavior for, you know, you get a record if you get good grades or you do your chores or you're going to have, you know, your records will be confiscated if you don't clean your room, you know. So they really became a you know, just an integral part of these of the family dynamics, and also you know between siblings, and, and even to this day, the Beatles remain a touchstone for adult siblings to, you know, spend hours 
hours, countless hours, you know, during the wee hours of the morning, you know, talking to their siblings. Well, what do you think this means? What about this? Do you like this? Well, what about Yoko? And what is, you know, all that stuff. And so it was something that happened with our siblings. But um, but getting back to the parents, I mean, the, they had a very hard time with their first, and of course the hair was a big problem, big, big problem. Um, people seem to relate to those uh, sections of the book very strongly, <laughs> where you know the battles between the um, sons and the fathers over the hair was just went on for quite a few years, really. Yes, it did. I, 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 I can support that. I can I can definitely confirm that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it did. <laughs> it it did. And 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 you know the one thing the one thing about the book that really blew me over was how. It, it was like it, it brought back a lot of the – it was like traveling back in time. You know, it was the whole atmosphere of of those days. And it was really – it you know, that's one of the things that was really wonderful about the book, Candy. And, um, you know, I've said this to you before, and, and, and I, I really do. It's one of the best books I've ever, I've ever seen that, you know, really summed up what the Beatles are all about. And, um, yes, that, thank you so yes. much. I mean, that's coming from you. That's a, a huge compliment. I mean, it really does seem to touch people in an emotional way, you know, and, and it, it brings them back to that time and not only the Beatles stuff, but, you know, I talk about the other music that we were listening to and, and things that were going on. So it really does bring people back. And so, but, you know, on one hand, the book, you know, you can read it sort of on a, you know, very face value kind of way. It's a trip down memory lane. It's nostalgic. It's emotional. But it also, you know, there are sort of layers under that. Um, so you can, you know, you can interact with the psychology of it or the, you know, the cultural history, the social science of it, whatever you want to call it. Or or you can, you know, take it at face value. But I think that when we look at the, you know, all these people's experience and you think about this collectively, you know, as, you know, millions and millions of young people with this common focus, you really do get, I, I mean, even for me now, having written the book and having been thinking about this for 50 years, I still sometimes step back at it, step back from it, and I'm amazed at how huge this thing was and how impactful it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, and it's even it's hard to even nowadays comprehend just what that was. I mean, it was very unique in those days. That's uh, that's all there was to it. So well, I keep going back to this thing that that when our, um in in Rolling Stone in 1968 when the Hunter Davies book came out, Jan Wenner did a review of it and he you know, said different things about it. And one of the things he said was um, nobody comments on the incredible weirdness of it, right? And I think that that's what he was getting at, even in 68, when there was still much weirdness to come. <laughs> and and mm-hmm. so I think that in the passage of time, that I, I think that my book gets at that weirdness. And, and sometimes I think, well, you know, I, I really started this book 15 years ago and I have to put it aside and this and that. Like maybe it was really all for the best because it required more passage of time to really get that sense of what happened. You know, that, that more time for reflection. There was one thing that um, that I felt when I finished the book, which is that you're kind of lucky in a subject, and I guess we all are since we all have this subject, and in that um, it really was a completely unique thing. I mean, Elvis was huge and had people going crazy, but it was for a very few years. Um, since the Beatles, there has been nothing like that. And the way the world is fragmented now, it seems sort of unlikely that there ever could be. What there is now is this kind of, you know, the the little period in between when Elvis went in the army and the Beatles came out um, less than 10 years years maybe like six years um you know people would get big you'd get a you'd have someone who'd have a hit or two or three and then the next person would come along and that's sort of like what it is now 
know, there's nobody that has the kind of broad appeal that everybody is into one way or another. And I, I just don't see that happening again. So you've, you've tapped into a really interesting period sociologically and musically and, and in a lot of other ways. It's, it's sort of, uh, you know, good luck, I think, you know. <laughs> well, I, I think right that it can never happen again i mean it it's just i mean if you think about it you know when when we watched the beatles and ed sullivan if you weren't watching that you had two other options of what you could watch well, okay so compare, <laughs> compare that to the to the band who goes on snl let's say who wants to be the next big thing well okay it's tv so it was nothing you know but think about all the competition mm-hmm. any performer has today it it's it's completely different i mean the audience it's fragmented. The, the entertainment industry is more fragmented. The, the technology. I mean, everything about it is different. The politics are different. It was really. A, it was. It was like I said. It was a confluence of forces. A perfect storm that that happened. You know, that came together and that it lasted for that long. You know, it lasted for six years. I mean, people say, oh. Well, there are other, you know, people say, well, what about Nirvana? What about Michael Jackson? And, you know, certainly there are elements of, you can look at other performers or other phenomena, other phenomena and say, well, it's sort of like the Beatles in this or that way. Yeah, but there's nothing, you know, Madonna, and she was an artist who did evolve and change, you know, as Bowie did and other, you know, but, but there was something about the Beatles as a constant presence for six years, right? I mean, day in, day out, every newspaper, every magazine, I mean, every time they did anything, we knew about it, you know? So it was like they were just part of the air, you know? Well, you say six years, but I'm I'm not sure it's actually ended, has it? (laughs) (laughs) No. It hasn't. In some ways, it hasn't. But, I mean, you know, for for first-generation fans, you know, I mean... The the initial impact, you know, was was that nonstop, you know, deluge, you know, for six years, just nonstop, you know, deluge sounds, images, ideas, nonstop flow of new, as I talk about it. I mean, yeah, I mean, it was not. There's nothing like it. I mean, it, sometimes I, one way I describe it, sometimes it's like a comet that was moving across the sky, very very slowly for six years. That just captivated, you know, just grabbed our attention, and then it just stopped, you know. But it was such, but it was such a, an amazing thing to witness that it, that it, and its impact was so profound that it it in some sense hasn't gone away. It's like, oh, remember that comet we watched for six years, you know? Not to mention all the beautiful music that was left behind, you know. So. It was a pretty amazing thing, and and you know you, you you asked me early on why I wanted to write the book. I mean, I wanted to document that, you know, how amazing it was, and and how it really, uh, you know, if you think about the size of our generation, you know, and how tuned in we were to them, you really have to conclude that the Beatles were are, are an important part of really American history, even though we often don't think about them in that way, but you know certainly. Um, you know, by the late 60s, there's no question, but that they, um, you know, sparked a lot of, um, you know, they empowered young people to really shake things up. Well, springing off of something that Alan was saying just before about the fact that, oh, yeah, you know, there were those, obviously, those six years, but that the, you know, the after effects of that are still going 50 years later. And so there have been now several generations of Beatles fans who have grown up in the years, in the 44, 45 years since the breakup. And I was thinking about that in your description of fans' feelings at the time of Let It Be, of the right. of the movie particularly, of seeing the movie and the fact, and of course, obviously, the day that Paul uh, Paul's quote unquote breakup announcement was made, uh, April tenth, nineteen seventy, um, and how uh, and how sad people were. And I've been wondering if you've gotten any sort of feedback from some of the younger generations of fans, thinking, well, wait a minute, you know, why would they have been so sad when? You know, they could have, they would have just 
you know, broken up for a short time, gotten their solo thing together, and then gotten back together, um, you know, because which would in later years would be the norm with the Stones right. or the Who or, or Genesis. You know, have you gotten any of that, you know, sort of... Uh, Why were you, you know, upset that you always get back together again? Like, there was no reason to be so upset, that kind of thing. Right, exactly. You know, like, why Why were they all so upset? Uh, nobody... No, the thing that young fans seem most intrigued about is, again, gets back to the hair. They don't understand how the hair was such a big deal. <laughs> That's the thing that, that they find very puzzling, which in, in a way makes sense. Um, but as far as the, why they, why, you know, not understanding why people were devastated, nobody, nobody actually has uh, raised that issue. I did get, actually today I got a letter from a, um, this really cute letter that my publisher sent to me from a uh, sixth grader whose teacher had recommended the book to her because she knew she was a big Beatle fan. And it was really interesting, it was this, you know, to, to get this letter from this, you know, young, what is it, probably 12 years old or something in sixth grade, how much, you know, she really enjoyed the book and the whole thing about the monkeys was new to her, this kind of, you know, this notion that fans, you know, kind of put the Beatles on a back burner and focus on the ones you shouldn't know that. Anyway, but, um, so I think that young people, you know, the feedback I've, I've, you know, I have a young, I've had gotten other feedback from young people who've read it and have enjoyed it, but as far as the not understanding the breakup, that one, I haven't heard that. But yeah, it's, yeah, well, what's the big, I mean, I think that in a way, maybe was actually, as I, I mean, I remember when they broke up, my feeling was it was sad, but that it seemed like, yeah. Oh, well, it had kind of run its course, and you know, it's it's not like they're not around anymore. And of course, McCartney mm-hmm. had come out, which which we liked a lot, and we thought, okay, mm-hmm. well, they'll be solo work. So never, I, I was not one of the people who cried. Um, you know, I cried. You know, other Beatle events, I cried about, not that one. <laughs> right. And also, yeah. not only were the Beatles putting out solo music, but it was successful. You know, right. you did have the success in 69 with the first few singles from John. And then in the right. 70s, you had Instant Karma. George exploded with All Things Must Pass. Paul had the and first I, McCartney album. And they, they all did very well. Right. And Live Peace in Toronto, which I love, still love. I've been listening to that a lot lately. Um, right. Yeah, so it, it wasn't like, to me personally, it didn't, I didn't have that, that kind of that feeling, but um, many people did, and it makes sense because, you know, where else in our life is that we're getting this, this amazing stimulation of music, ideas, wacky nonsense, all kinds of fun, you know, ways of, I mean, it's, <laughs> I was just looking at something somebody had posted today, put together a, a video to, I mean, just... <laughs> I, I, it's it, it's just the silliness, you know. That we love the silliness of it. The, I mean, the, of course, the music was, you know, the, the point of entry. But all the stuff that they that they presented to us and how they challenged us and delighted us for six years. I mean, of course, we're going to be upset when that. It's not going to happen anymore, really. That's over. How could that be? You know. Yeah. Could I just expand on this conversation that Al brought up first, and, and you were just talking about, Candy. The one thing that struck me the most in reading your book is, is this whole idea that you bring up several times about fans taking a Beatle break, which I never really heard about before. And especially once you get to Rubber Soul, and you comment quite a lot about Revolver here, that the changes the Beatles were making at that time were so drastic, and it was hard for a lot of fans to adjust to them. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the lyrics, getting far more intelligent, far more introspective. You even had a quote in there from one fan who I believe couldn't couldn't reconcile the fact that here's John Lennon writing lyrics to the word, and then on the same album he's writing the same lyrics for Run For Your Life. Right. You know, here he is on the one hand saying the word is love to the world, and the other is about this guy who wants to kill his girlfriend. Right. You know, and you have all this kind of, this mix and then you've got all these different musical genres entering the picture with all the Indian uh, music and, and so much eclecticism and the weirdness of the psychedelic music. And there's even a quote here that I, I just want to bring up in your book where you say, fans were still believing the earlier Beatle music 
and were intrigued with the warm sound and grown-up lyrics of Rubber Soul, but Revolver was more than many fans were ready for. I mean, I'd like to know, not just from your perspective, but from all of us, what, was this change so drastic that it was hard for us to adjust to? And even you were, you were saying before, Candy, how a lot of fans went to the Monkees, and part of the Monkees' appeal was the fact that you know, they were capturing a lot of the, the Beatle fans who loved what they were first exposed to, the lighter stuff, the right. more fun stuff, you know, from 64, 65, whatever. I mean, did we all experience that? Let me, let me first hear what Candy has to say. Mm-hmm. About Rub- Revolver being so much more weird than, than Rubber Soul? I personally don't remember it being that. I mean, yes, it was different, um, but, I, I mean, that was not my experience. I mean, I was pretty open-minded. I had an older sibling, you know. I was like taking it as it as it came. Now that said, I was a huge Monkees fan. I mean, personally, that that was not my experience. I, I mean, I did love the Monkees. I was a huge Davy Jones fan, but I was also listening to the Beatles. For me, it was a broadening of things. You know, I started listening to Donovan. I started listening to other things. Um, you know, while never abandoning the Beatles. Um, but as, as I show in the book, I mean, a lot of younger fans and not, not only not exclusively younger ones, some older ones, too, just didn't like the, um, you know, Love You Too, Tomorrow Never Knows. It was, you know, they just they couldn't get into it. They found it. They used phrases like it wasn't pleasant to my ears. But that nobody was talking about it being druggy at that point. I don't I don't recall. I don't think so. that didn't happen until Sergeant Pepper. Of course, in retrospect, then you know we we all knew. But um, yeah, I, that was not my experience. But clearly, a lot of young fans did not. You know, some they just sounded too strange. They were, that the Beatles were evolving too fast for them. Basically, is what it came down to. And also they like to dance, you know, that's another overlooked thing, especially girl fans really enjoy dancing. And one of the things about the White Album was was that uh, it was really brought back a lot of the people who had been on this Beatle break, that I call it, um, because, you know, there, fully one third of the songs on the White Album are danceable. So it brought back that early you know, gush of Beatleness, so it's what, you know, which is what a lot of young fans enjoyed initially, which was that you could spin around, dance with your friends and all that. So, um, but, but to get back to your question, for me, I never abandoned them when they got strange. I was kind of open to it, you know, but, but clearly some people were not. What about you guys? I never went on a Beatle break. Um, for me, you know, I, I waited for each of these things to come out. I'd come home from school and listen to the radio just in case there wasn't going to be a new Beatle record. And, um, and yeah, Revolver got strange and Pepper got strange, but it was kind of cool strange, you know. It was mm. – I like the idea that you never knew what it was going to be next, and yet – as different as it was, their voices were so recognizable, and so it was always still them. Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, and I mean, I had listened to a lot of other music at the same time. I mean, and for me, there was also classical music, but, um, you know, it, the whatever they were going to do, you know, I was willing to sort of listen along. I mean, even when um, you were talking about in the book John and Yoko's experimental albums, I mean, I even sort of got those when they came out. And I mean, I I have to admit, I listened to Life with the Lions maybe once or twice, and maybe once. (laughs) And and, uh, really sort of, you know, I mean, Cambridge 1969 was just not something you were going to play every afternoon. And um, But you know, I mean, I've listened to them since. I've listened to Two Virgins a, a number of times since. Um, the Wedding Album may be least of all. But, you know, really, wherever they were going to go, to me, was automatically interesting because they were who they were and their track record was what it was. Exactly, yeah. I, yeah. I agree. You you were, you know, there was some, there was this middle, you know, like not everybody... Uh, went on, you know, who who found it strange. Like they would, ne- it was never a full rejection. It was always like, well, I'm not ready for this yet, or or um, next year, or you know. In other words, it, it, it was never rejected outright because there was this reservoir of trust that had been created by '66 
So even though things got strange and less accessible, and maybe you weren't really listening, you were kind of, you know, you, you know, you, you said, like, okay, it's still the Beatles, you know, and, and, and you kind of assumed you'd get back to it at some point. Or the other thing that often happened is people would hear it coming out of their, you know, brother or sister's room, and they would start to like it just because they heard it more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But um, I think, was this feeling that, you know, they were getting strange? I mean, wasn't that some, didn't Queen Elizabeth say that at some point? It's like, the Beatles are getting rather strange. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know. But I think Candy and I had a similar similar experience in that um, I also was listening to, you know, because there was all of this great new music coming out, you know, with folk rock and with, uh, you know, the, uh, the expansion of the British invasion into other musical avenues and all. And I was really enjoying all of it. So I was, so I was, I guess, very receptive to kind of going, you know, going with the flow, which may be why, why Rubber Soul is still one of my maybe three favorite Beatles albums. And, and it was the same with, with Revolver, that, you know, even though there were all of these different musical uh, flavors in there, and even if I wasn't particularly ready for you know, the Indian music and even if Tomorrow Never Knows did sound a little a little weird, I was you know, I was still willing to kind of go along with it. You know, whereas I think maybe It mm-hmm. was challenging, you know, and maybe, yeah, some, maybe exactly. some people didn't want to be challenged in that way, you know. But it yeah. was it was definitely it required work. I mean that was the you know, people that was the phrase people use it, the sense that it required some work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How about you, Steve? Um, I did take a Beatle break, but not until not during the not during the you know it was after you know once Paul left, you know I didn't follow the four solo solo Beatles as closely as I followed the group. But um, during you know during the Beatle years, yeah, I was in fact I remember hearing that breakup report on on the radio and I was my mouth just dropped it was like oh my god no you know because we always thought they were going to be there and and the idea of them not being there was pretty shocking at least to me you know but it was definitely a shock it was definitely a, a shock the, the reaction of course you know back then was a lot different than it would have been today because the press still had this kind of you know these were just kids type of thing, you know, they they didn't respect them as much as, you know, they as they do now, and, um, but, you know. I'm not trying to find what you're saying, because I think by, by the end, the press, you know, had, uh, well, you said that the press didn't respect them at that point, so I was saying, I don't know what period you're talking about, but I think by the end, they were actually fairly highly respected by the press. No, I, mm. well, I mean, as, as, as respected as they are now. Oh, okay. um, There was always... There was always kind of a condescending attitude in the press with oh, music yeah. in those days. At least that's, yeah. that, that's, the, that's the way I remember it. Um, I mean, you know. I, I think that changed a lot after. I, I think it. I mean, it. I think it changed with Rubber Soul. I mean, that they got mm-hmm. some cred with Rubber Soul, and I think it. We, you know, certainly by the time of Pepper, I mean, course, Pepper doesn't hold up as well as Rubber Soul or Revolver in most people's view. But, you know, there were all these superlatives about Pepper and them as artists and, and all this. And I don't know. I mean, I think, I mean, there was always a little bit of, begr- you know, they, they were praised grudgingly, but they were praised by then, by the end. I, I mean, that's my sense of that. Alan, what do you think? What's your sense of that? Um, I think that they were, you know, they Going all the way back, last week we talked about um, with the Beatles, and there was a, a British classical music critic, William Mann, who wrote very respectfully of them all the way back then. And uh, um, through the years in American publications, it varied. I mean, um, I, I saw condescending reviews all the way through, but also respectful reviews. It, it kind of depended what publication and and who was writing you know i mean every mm. by by the late 60s you were beginning to get 
people who were young enough to know what was going on with this stuff getting onto staffs of newspapers and mm -hmm. magazines. And so they wrote about it in a completely different way. But on the other hand, as, as you point out in the book, you, you also have people who are young enough to know what's happening but are just too hip for it to be, <laughs> to be still okay. And so we're attacking them from a completely different direction, you know, right. for, for being commercial and, uh, and everything. Right. So, um, Ed Ward. Steve's point is, is correct. I mean, certainly with the passage of time, there's no question. I mean, it's it, it certainly become the, the, you know, there's no, you know, it's, it's fairly unanimous at this point, certainly, sure. but maybe less so, you know, in the moment. That could be. Hmm. You know, people are still listening to this music and, you know, assuming we still you know, or have the capacity to listen to music in, you know, 50, 100, 200 years from now, I think people will still be listening to the Beatles. There's no question about it. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, I think, yeah, I think so, too. Just going back to the original question, I was never really, I never took a Beatle break as a little kid, and I certainly found Rubber Soul to be easily digestible. I mean, I, I went through that like water. I mean, I had no problem listening to Rubber Soul. There was a little bit of weirdness on Revolver, certainly with Tomorrow Never Knows, but I loved all the songs on, on Revolver, and we're talking about the American Revolver. But one thing that, yeah. since, Alan, you just brought up our, our last show with, with talking about with the Beatles, something that we sometimes forget is that often it's said that it's pretty remarkable that the Beatles went from Love Me Do to Tomorrow Never Knows, and really and truly less than four years. But yeah. for us Americans who didn't even hear Love Me Do until 1964, which is most of us, you know, mm -hmm. we're talking about two and a half years. Right. <laughs> so no, it's, yeah. uh, you know, Amazing. it's an incredible change in such a short period of time. It is. It is. And the, and the freak, the, you know, how, how prolific they were. I mean, the span of time between um, Rubber Soul and Revolver is less than a year. Right. I mean, if you think about that now, I mean, it's just it's just unbelievable. The, the, the outpouring of music. Well, just as the mere fact that they released in those six years and we'll, we'll, we'll use it simpler to use the, the British albums because it's all uniform. Right. But the fact that in those six years they released 13 albums, that's, yeah. that's an incredible amount yeah. of music to release and you know i mean there there are bands now that don't release 13 albums in in a 30-year career right yeah again I mean, it's just one of the other things about the whole thing that was weird you know that mm -hmm. you have in this relatively short period of time this large you know proportionate to the time this huge volume of amazing music you know mm -hmm. and it, it, it's it's just kind of mind-boggling you know and 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 that you had this, the, the riveted attention of millions of young people all over the world eagerly anticipating the next thing and, and being dazzled again, you know, over and over and over again. It, it was just it was kind of an amazing thing. <laughs> Candy, can we just address, because um, I always love to talk about what I call beyond the music, Yes. And you address a lot of these issues of what brought the Beatles so much appeal, aside from the music itself. And one of the things that I know that you talk about is the, um, what you call transformation of gender roles. Yeah. And I'm going to quote you in here in the book. You said, girls like boys who were Beatle-like, mm -hmm. who were free and had enough imagination to venture outside the confines of male stereotypes. So... Right. I know you also talk about the fact that, and, and some fans in the book related to the fact that early on, they loved the Beatles a lot because they saw four friends together mm -hmm. who were interacting. They were, they were like best buddies, yeah. and that was part of their appeal. Could you uh, go a little bit further and talk about, aside from the music, why the Beatles were so popular? Well, you know, like, uh, you, like you were just saying about the, the friendship that we saw between them, and that you know, men and, you know, girls, boys, men, women, young men and women saw this, and it was a very different kind of thing. So you have these four men 
who, I mean, you look at the nonverbal communication between the four of them on Ed Sullivan. I mean, they're just glowing, beaming, you know, and we're looking at this, and we had never seen men who looked like this, who sounded like this, and who behaved like that. And then, you know, so there was this sense of this, you know, the what Mick Jagger called the four-headed monster. But we didn't see that, you know, we saw them as this, great, you know, these guys, these, these, these close friends, you know, the love between them. And that was actually, this is why boys didn't pick a favorite, is because they didn't want to see them separately. What, what appealed to young men, you know, the mm-hmm. teenage boys, was this camaraderie. Because, you know, the, they, cause it was a different way of being a male in the world. And so that was very appealing. Mm. And, and girls liked it. <laughs> they screamed for it. You know, so I don't do that. So I answered the question. There was a the first part of your question was um, I'm not sure if I I sort of answered it in reverse. What was the about the gender? What was the first part? That girls like boys who were beetle like. Exactly. Yeah. They had that, an imagination. Not the, yeah. Yes. Not only the appearance, but yeah, girls like boys who were beetle like. So there's the appearance and the softness that they weren't macho. You know. That was very appealing, and also that they um, that they had the audacity, the freedom, you know, to to embrace the freedom that the Beatles seemed to represent. So the boys who grew their hair, you know, they were, you know, girls liked that because it was it was you know it was Beatle like and and it showed audacity and it made them part of this thing, you know, and and because you know the the really it just. They represented freedom. They represented freedom. They sounded like what freedom sounds like, you know, and, and that was a big part of the appeal. And part of the freedom from what? Freedom to do what? And, and part of it was the whole gender thing, you know, and, and um, thinking about John as a feminist, which we don't often do. We think about his, um, you know, peace, you know, peace activist, anti-war activist and all that. But you know, at the end, he was very much a feminist, and, you know, had he lived, he may have been able to, um, you know, make some progress in that area, perhaps. But getting back to the, but they, they did represent a different way of being male in the world, and women like that, you know. But actually, I, let me say one more thing about that. Um, mm. There was a split, though, between their words and, you know, the personas in the song and their personal lives, of course, because we know that while they ref- the lyrics, I mean, this is actually the first thing I ever wanted to write about the Beatles, is really about some of this gender stuff in the lyrics. You know, they're much more egalitarian. The women are friends. You know, it's, it's a very different ethos about male-female relationships in the song, but we know in their personal lives, not so much. I mean, they were products, you know, I'm not faulting them for that. They're products of their time and place. But, um, so there's really something aspirational, in a sense, about that. But, you know, so women, you know, women heard these songs, and it was like, okay, that's good. You know, that's how men should be, yeah. (laughs) Which is an an interesting, uh, an interesting comment on, on the times. Very interesting. Yeah, we forget. You know, we you know, it's funny, you look at some of this old footage and you it was really a different world. It was just a different world. I mean it's like Mad Men, you know, mm-hmm. like the first few weeks of Mad Men. Right. And um, mm-hmm. I actually hadn't I was not a Mad Men Mad Men watcher, but when I was working on the book I made a point of watching all of them because I had read that um you know, that there was a certain yeah, well, for this, a huge Beatles fan, and he was really a you know made a great effort to capture the ear, you know the the whole everything about the time. So I, have, I should watch this, you know, and I and I found them really interesting and in, in how they um, you know dealt with the coming of the Beatles. I didn't think they handled it particularly well, but I found it kind of interesting. But anyway, yes, it was a different world. It was a very different world, you know, and so that's why there are you know I mean. The, the other gender piece that is interesting is the whole who becomes a musician, you know. So on February 10th, 1964, boys lobbied their parents for guitars or drums or whatever, you know. Well, girls couldn't really do that, you know. It wasn't an option. 
Um, maybe you got an acoustic guitar, you know, but as a couple of the women I interviewed said, you know, they didn't want to be Joni Mitchell or Don Baez. They wanted to be John Lennon. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and those who did really, really swam against the tide. You know, so people like Chrissy Hines and the Hart sisters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the gender thing is, is a very interesting part of this that I think there's actually a lot more to say about. Um, so when I think about a possible follow-up to Beetle Nest, that's something I think about exploring further. I just have one other observation that, um, uh, and, and actually I mentioned this to the other guys, uh, my co-hosts, last week. Um, I have to say your description of Ed Sullivan as a stiff cardboard cut out of a man with a face that said school tomorrow is absolutely yeah. inspired. <laughs> it's the Thank best description you. I've ever read of Ed Sullivan. Thank you. Thank right, I was telling them that I, you know, in, in my in my book, I tried to kind of describe describe Ed Sullivan for all the generations that are too young to remember him, but you did it in one line. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that's I, I like that line. Thank you for noticing. Yeah. I, I, I'll take that as a great compliment from you guys. I really appreciate that. Anyway. All right. Well, this this has been fantastic having you on the show, Candy, and we we wish you. Much success with the book. Thank you. And um, you, you do have your own website, correct? I do, yeah, BeetleNest.com. And there's a blog there that I pretty much have been keeping up to date with pithy comments. Today was actually a big day in Beetleness. I had a thing in Next Avenue, which is a PBS thing. So it's like I'm, I'm on PBS's radar. Yay! <laughs> All right. Good for you. Congrats, congratulations. That's great, yeah. Yeah, this is, and that was big. And, of course, my daughter, who's a PR maven in Brooklyn, she got Beetleness in the U.S. Airways in-flight magazine for me. Right. It's in their December issue in their, like, yeah. gift box. So everybody who flies on U.S. Airways is going to theoretically see that. You've been doing great because I've been seeing you all over the place. Yes. All right. So, yes, but thank you for all your encouragement. It really means a lot because you guys are experts, and so I, I'm very chuffed, as the lads would say. I really uh-huh. appreciate it a lot. And on behalf of uh, the rest of us, we're only going to fly U.S. Airways, okay, because of the support <laughs> of the book. And uh, like I said, much success with the book. Again, your website is BeetleNest.com, and people can order the book from the website. No, I can get it anywhere. Amazon, um, Barnes and Noble. You know, I mean, brick and mortar Barnes and Noble seem to have it. Um, you know, Amazon of course, is the way that people buy books these days. But you know, people, any indie bookstore will order a book for you. Like if you want to shop local, you can just I have a link for that. You know, so but it's anywhere books are sold, basically. You know, which means mostly you know this. Um, people buy books on Amazon, but it's also an ebook and it's also an audio book. Hey, Al, did you do the whole? Did you get through the whole audio book? Yes, and enjoyed it immensely. Okay. So, Candy, thanks so much for being on the show. We had a blast. And much success with the book. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking with you guys. And for things we said today, this is Ken Michaels, and on behalf of Steve Marinucci, Alan Cozen, and Al Sussman, we'll see you all next time.